Hey everyone, welcome back to another interview for the Underworld Patreon podcast. Today I'm talking with Luis Chaparro. He's a Mexican journalist who grew up in Ciudad Juarez, kind of when it was, I think, the most deadliest city in the world. He's freelanced for everyone you can think of. I think recently he's been doing a lot of work for Vice, and he's super tapped in to the drug wars in Mexico, the narco wars, the cartels. I mean, if you've seen something with guys from the Sinaloa cartel, it's usually him who's been, been the one setting it up. You know, he does a lot of fixing work and stuff like that. He, I mean, the last thing I saw from him was about partying with these guys and being in like a, a place where they, you know, sort and produce the, the fentanyl that they're shipping over the border. So we definitely talked about that and a lot of other stuff and what's going on with Caro Quintero and basically how he got these big scoops uh, years ago about El Chapo's escape and, and El Mayo's kids and things like that. So hope you guys enjoy. Luis, thanks so so much for joining us, man. I really appreciate you uh, you coming on. And I guess, um, you know, my first question, I think, is related to the fact that uh, every time I see something crazy and like with the Sinaloa cartel, you know, you're one of the guys who's arranging it or in the middle of it. Um, I just seen something about you kind of parting with these guys. And I- I'm intrigued. Like, I want to know what's your background that you're able to sort of connect with uh, with with these people? Hey, Danny, first of all, thank you. Thank you for having me. And um, I guess uh, I guess how I started or, or my background into all this, getting into talking to these people is uh, a, a bit of a mix of uh, where I grew up and how I started as a journalist. I, I was born in Ciudad Juarez, uh, Mexico, right across the border from El Paso, Texas. And, um, you know, in 2010, around 2010, Ciudad Juarez was branded like the most dangerous city in the world and like the deadliest city in the world because we were having an average of 30 murders a day. So, and, 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 and back then I was just starting into, you know, like getting attracted uh, uh, to, to journalism. And, um, but, but when I, when I grew up, I, I grew up in the nineties here in, here in Ciudad Juarez and I went to school with some of the uh, youngest um, Younger sons of uh, Amado Carrillo Fuentes, the Señor de los Cielos. Um, I, I started to to know them and to know also many of his uh, associates. You know, like not necessarily like top uh, cartel bosses, but people who worked around El Señor de los Cielos or around the Cartel de Juarez. And so when I first started like poking around journalism, it was in two thousand eight, I think two thousand seven when the so-called war against drug cartels started in Mexico. So the whole uh, Mexican army was deployed to the streets and they started in Ciudad Juarez. So that generated a lot of violence in, in this city. And it was really fascinating to, uh, I mean, it was really fascinated to, to know how my old friends from, from high school, from middle school, you know, how, how were they leaving? Because I, I knew that they were involved um, in in some level into the drug cartel war. So I first started going out to them. I wasn't writing anything. I was just basically curious to know what was going on. There was a web page called, uh, it was it was in YouTube. There was a YouTube channel before YouTube uh, became huge in, in Mexico, at least. It was, uh, it, it was called Quita Puercos. And that's basically Spanish for pig remover. And by pigs, uh, they were referring to, to cops, of course. Mm. But they started killing a lot of a lot of cops in the city because they, the cartel wanted to have the full control of the local police uh, in, in Ciudad Juarez. And most of the local police officers were or had ties to the Juarez cartel. So there was like a very dark times in, in Juarez, man. Uh, we we started seeing something that maybe it's a, a bit. Uh, I mean, not, I, I don't want to say normal, but it's more we're more more used to it. And I mean, uh, bodies hanging from from the, from bridges, um, you know, like dismembered bodies all over the, the city, all that kind of stuff. We were not used to uh, at all. So when all of that started like popping up, of course, I had a lot of questions and I had a lot of uh, curiosity. And I thought I knew some of the people who was somewhat involved into all this. So I started reaching out to my old friends 
and asking them like, hey, do you know what's happening here? Do you know it, it's uh, they're actually killing cops and why? They started telling me a bunch of stories about what they were listening in their houses, uh, what they were doing uh, inside the cartel. And, and most of them were actually leaving the city because it was too dangerous even for them, you know. They were like, you know, uh, fuck it, we're moving to El Paso. <laughs> so that was, uh, to me, that, that all was really fascinating. Um, and I guess that's how I uh, first uh, started getting around um, contacts that will later on be my sources inside um, the uh, drug cartel. You know, it's it's one thing for someone like me to come down and report there for like a week or two and then go home. But obviously for Mexican journalists, it's a, it's a lot more dangerous, especially it's like someone like you, I think, who, you know, they know who you are and they know your family. So is that is that a major concern when you're when you're working on some of these stories? Yeah, man, definitely. I mean, to be honest, you never know when they're gonna be pissed or not. And it's not like you can't go and ask for fucking information all the time, you know? Like it's that wouldn't be journalism, that would be, that would be like maybe PR or some shit like that. So I I've had my my uh, ugly and undesired encounters with with some of these people, especially with local police officers. Um, you know. The I guess the biggest threat we face now in Mexico, it's not really uh, drug cartels. I think it's uh, it's the uh, politicians. It's it's when you talk about them, it's when you start asking the questions about how are they becoming so fucking rich? Um, because most of the times, it's it's not only that they're stealing money from the city or, or from the state or from the country. It's because they're actually getting cuts from the drug cartels, at least that, that was happening before. And so, I, I, I mean, to, to answer your, your, your question, I, 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 yeah, I do have fear, you know, for, for my life, for, for my family. I've, I've had my share. I have, I've had um, uh, three times a gun to my head. But uh, I've learned a lot, man. I mean, I've learned a lot on how to approach these people. And... Not not in the in the in the sense of like this is gonna make them peace or whatever, but about how to be full transparent and fully honest with them about what am I doing and what am I writing on without compromising the um, you know like, like the ethics of, of journalism. Yeah, I mean, you had this story I think uh, a little while ago. You were there showing the Sinaloa cartel like working with fentanyl and all that. How do you how do you go about setting something like that up? Yeah, I mean that. Of course, it's a uh, it's a years long um, trust relationship I've developed with some sources in Sinaloa. Um, of course, like the first times I started going to places like Culiacan or around, um, they were very skeptical of what the hell I was doing there. But at the very beginning, I wasn't even taking a camera or my cell phone or anything. I was just me and um, a small notebook and my and my pen. So they started like trusting, you know, like they started trusting. I was not trying to get them in trouble, but I was actually really trying to understand what was happening with the Sinaloa cartel. Because um, one of the first stories I, I wrote when I went to, to Sinaloa was like, is El Chapo really the mastermind behind the Sinaloa cartel? And why is there like factions? Or, uh, th- th- at that time, the Sinaloa cartel was breaking into small factions. That was uh, like the very beginning of, of that. Um, uh, I don't know about that uh, the vision. I mean, so um, they started like, trusting me. They started like taking me to places or getting me interviews. You know, with maybe lowest level of the chain in, inside the inside the cartel. Um, then I started like calling back and setting up like secure forms of uh, communication. And they were like pretty cool with it. They were like, okay, so this dude writes and he goes by his word, or he's not gonna say more than he needs to say. And and sometimes also it's been on my end when I call it off when I say like you know what if it's if I'm not speaking to this person or if we're not actually looking or seeing proof of this happening then it's not worth it to me I know it might be too risky for you but let's just leave it at that and I'll be cool with that and let's just have a beer or whatever and and they will under, uh, understand that all right this guy is not looking for info to maybe you know like sell it to the U S or working with the feds or whatever. He's just literally here to do journalism, and if he's not getting the story he needs, uh, he's just gonna fucking leave and, and leave it at that. So I think that started like earning trust around them. So this, this last time, 
when I went into to the to the, to the uh, fentanyl lab, it was my second time in a in a different um, fentanyl laboratory in Culiacan. And uh, what I wanted to know is like it, the new developments around fentanyl. Fentanyl was sort of like popping up like crazy, and so they showed me how they're moving like huge laboratories into small um, apartments, trying to avoid big losses. Yeah, I mean. Besides all that too, I think the other thing that that I thought was really interesting was you had you'd gone to parties with these guys, you know, like you know them that well, and you had said something about how you know their souls are no longer in their bodies. Can you yeah. kind of, can you elaborate a bit on on what you meant by that? Because I think a lot of people are fascinated, you know, not just by the back and forth, but also like who are these young men that are just you know f- like they know the consequences, they know what it's like. I guess they grow up in the circumstances, so they end up joining up. But like, who are these guys? Exactly. You know, what are they like? Yeah, definitely, man. I mean, these guys grew up with a with a myth of El Chapo, right? Like they're they're pretty pretty young guys uh, around their twenties, and they grew up with a with the myth of El Chapo, with the myth of uh, El Mayo, and with the respect they get. These people come from they they're not from the city or from a big city. You know, they come from like very small towns around Sinaloa, very impoverished. Um, places where they have to look for the opportunities. And in places like those, by design, the cartel is filling the gap that is uh, left by by the government. And talking not only financially or economically, but also like opportunities for culture. Uh, if they don't, if they don't get, you know, like proper uh, culture that was that we're getting in, in, in the bigger uh, cities, the narco is filling in that gap. So they started, they start playing with guns. They start playing with being a boss at an early age. They start watching convoys of, of armed men uh, showing up in the city with big pickup trucks and showing off their jewelry and showing off their power and giving to the people. So most of their families, I mean, even their moms, their dads, they're like, I hope you will be one of those big, Señorones, one day, you know, like one of these big sirs, one day, um, or these big misters, one day, and so they they grew up like that, and of course, not of all of them make it. I will I will say no one really makes it, but um, but they they try and they try to get involved and they give their lives um, to whoever they're serving. Uh, the people uh, who I was partying with were the personal security. Let's, let's start like that for El Mayo, Zambada forces in, in, in Culiacan. So that makes them a fucking legend in places like Culiacan, right? So they're like, okay, so you're the forces for Señor del Sombrero, for El Mayo Zambada, which is a legend in itself. And, um, and, and, and they, but, but I mean, imagine what it takes to be there, you know, the, the competence, uh, you know, like the, around the same circle. Everybody wants to be there. Everyone wants to give security to El Mayo Zambada because they feel that one day uh, that's going to pay, you know, and, and there will be there will be a time where they're going to be as big as El Mayo. And they get respect from a lot of uh, people just by saying they work for El Mayo directly. So when, when they reach a certain level, like let's call it, I don't know, like a commander, in charge of uh, Mayo Zambada security or whatever. By the time they reach that level, their soul is gone. They're, they've seen too much. They've lived too much. And they have to use a lot of fucking shit to stay awake or to get to sleep. So they, they go to sleep with pills and they wake up on a, on a you know, like a bump of coke. And I'm, I mean, obviously not judging. And I think that's, uh, that's one of the main things that, uh, that, has allowed me to get close closer to them. It's because I'm not judging uh, to whatever they're fucking doing in the life they chose to to leave. I, I see them completely as as human beings uh, taking decisions that they thought they they needed to take as as I did with journalism and living in fucking Mexico. You know, uh, that's a that's a, a, a decision I I did on myself and upon my life. So we we get to talk, we get to speak, and and they see me. Um, honestly fascinated by their stories and, and by their, their lives. And so the last time I was in Bulacan, uh it was on, on my on my 31st uh, birthday. 
and they invited me to to one of their one of their houses, like one of the houses where they where they live, not even where they where they work, like a safe house or whatever. They were it was like a small gathering, of course. Uh, they had a lot of security, um, and they made sure that I wasn't being tracked, that I wasn't uh, tracking my my path to, to their house or whatever. Uh, and it was it was pretty fun, man. I mean, to be honest, it was interesting. <laughs> I, I showed up. Uh, of course, they had all kinds of alcohol, all kinds of beer, and, every, and everything. I showed up with a fucking six pack of the cactus, you know. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, I was trying to say, like, man, this is this is the me. I'm not showing up. I'm not bringing up, you know, like this fancy bottle of tequila or wine or whatever. It's just this is this is me, and I'm trying to be honest with you. And I show, and this is what I drink, you know. This I drink red tecates, and I was just uh, ready to to drink like a like a six so i can go home early because i had to keep working at the next day um so yeah man but i i noticed uh how when you are at a party with your friends you're 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 supposed to be happy you're supposed to be celebrating you're supposed to be chatty you know um and those guys were pretty quiet just uh, playing their own narco corridos on on the tv over and over um and i mean if if they said 10 words i will be i will be amazed yeah i mean i just want like our listeners to know how rare this sort of access and insight into uh, into these guys is like this is not a thing that i think even journalists in mexico who cover the drug war let alone anyone from the us doing like documentaries or whatever typically gets access to so it's actually i mean i'm like fascinated just hearing this stuff and um you know the families pushing them into it too is really interesting like i think a lot of people I would say get involved in criminal elements because they're born into poverty, right? And they have very few opportunities. And I'm sure that's the case for a lot of people involved in the narco world as well. But I think also not just there, but but in the US and in other gang cultures too, there is this cool factor now that really pulls people in. So you have kids that are middle class that are rich kids that are that are getting involved in this life and in this world. I mean, is that is that something you see as well? Yes, definitely, man, and that's that's happening more and more. I mean, the uh, the cool factor, as we call it, around the narco cultura, it's 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 getting big, and now kids that maybe they didn't grow up impoverished, you know, like they, they grew up in middle class or high 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 class uh, uh, neighborhoods, uh, you know, um, they they're, they're trying to go in or trying to hang out with these people or trying to you know like bring some value to them so they can be part of them and when you're when you're young and you're trying to belong to certain circle i mean one thing is to try to belong to your you know like so the rapper friends in high school but, but the other thing is like trying to belong to mayo sambara uh forces or you know like el chapo uh sons people you know that's that's totally different and you you could easily get killed um, not because they will get pissed at you and say like, ah, oh, fuck you, you are a fucking poster, but because they're going to use you, right? They're going to use you yeah. to go and, and raid a house and go and do, do some stupid shit they don't want to do. And just trying to belong, you're going to do that. And of course, that's, that's going to get you killed. Yeah, I mean, they're, uh, the, I think the, the lifespan of someone involved in that life is not uh, extremely high. You know, there's people who probably yes. dying out in their teens and 20s. And that also goes along with my my plan to stop kids from joining gangs was basically yeah. to convince the um you know the kids in like you know they're joining when they're 15 16 I don't know if it'll work in Mexico my plan to make it stop in the US is just to convince the 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 women that are 15 and 16 the teenage girls not to date gang members and then you know problem <laughs> solved right there it's like a foolproof plan <laughs> <laughs> maybe not maybe that's not pretty dope. That's, I, that's, I think it would help man i honestly think it would help for sure for Why sure man. that's a pretty dope fucking plan I mean, yeah, there I don't you know go. that will not play in, in mexico but yeah maybe i should start doing the same like stop dating cartel people you know <laughs> there you go i think nautical. um <laughs> it's not just partying though like you've been you've been on the ground doing this for for more than a decade but you've been involved and you've done some reporting on some of i think the biggest events or or incidents or stories in the uh in the drug war in mexico over the last decade or so i think you know i'm thinking of el chapo's escape right you talked to that doctor mm -hmm. and then also with kiki camarena and and yeah. and his murder you were involved in in exposing or, or you had knowledge of some of the stuff that happened there can you basically explain to us like those two events and, and sort of how 
or how you were involved and, and what you saw on the ground reporting on them? Sure, definitely, man. Um, so when, when El Chapo escaped for the second time, um, uh, it, he always escaped on Saturday. I don't know why. I guess he had to do something with the, with the, <laughs> with the guards of the priest. Or but it was always a fucking Saturday. And I remember I, I was uh, having a ugly headache, you know. Not a, <laughs> I was super hangover. Um, and I started, like, watching the news all over that he, he escaped again. And it was like, what? A second time. That was unbelievable. I started reporting. I put out like a couple of stories around his escape with the sources I had and and some some details. Um, but then, like uh, I guess after a year or so, no, I can't remember exactly. But I, I, well, after he got cap- recaptured now for the third time, um, a month later after he got recaptured, I got a call to my personal cell phone. I don't know it was to my work cell phone back then, uh, and it was a doctor who told me he was living in El Paso and that was, he was very afraid because the um, U.S. authorities were threatening him with deporting him back to, back to Mexico. And he told me, if I get deported, I'm pretty sure going to get killed along with all of my family. So he started telling me this crazy story about how he is a surgeon in, in, in Ciudad Juarez, uh, but he got married to a woman who was the sister of one of the lieutenants for El Chapo that he wasn't really involved and it was like all fun and games until uh the the uh he's what is it like the husband of his i mean the, the brother of, her, of his wife what do you call that uh brother his, of his, uh, wife. his uh his brother-in-law brother-in-law yeah, a couple yeah, yeah. yeah that's pretty complicated yeah basically <laughs> his, his brother-in-law start, started like threatening him to to leave on his house because they were after him so he was like get the fuck out of your own house and let him leave here and give me your car. And he started like asking or requesting or basically stealing more and more from him. So he, well, one time he thought, you know, this is, this is unbelievable. I, I can't live like this. He went up to the, um, to one of the international bridges to speak to CDP officers and told him, you know what? I know where one of your main guys is. Um, one of the main guys they're looking for it, uh, leaves and, and is staying as, as of this moment. Of course, they dismissed them, uh, so they had to go to the military authorities. After a few talks with them, they actually arrested this guy. It was, it was called El Marrufo. If you Google that guy, he was like a huge thing or a huge figure inside the Sinaloa cartel for, and very close to El Chapo. So they captured that guy. And, and this doctor leaves to the U.S. with his family under the DA protection. And he's like, okay, you need to come over and leave here. They set him up a small house, and they start, like, giving him uh, a small amount of money, like, at the end, right? This is, this is where you're going to leave on um, while you get your feet on the ground. Um, so after that, a couple of agents from the DA started, like, pre- pushing him to keep handing information. He's like, it's not like I have information. I just had that because he, I, I, I was related to him. But uh, they're like, okay, if you don't have anything else, then I think it's time for you to go back to Mexico because you cannot live here uh, but for free. You know, you don't have legal status and all of that. So after he, he told me all of this, I was like, okay, this, this is a very interesting story, but I need you to show up to, to the newsroom and bring papers or documents or photos so I can actually know that all, all of this that you tell me is actually true. And so he showed up and he showed up with an S visa, which is basically like, we call it like the snitch visa. It's a visa hmm. for people who, you know, like who hands out information in, in exchange of legal status in the U.S. Um, and so this guy then told me, okay, so they started like pushing on me so hard that I knew one of the girls who was all the time with El Chapo. Um, I started like flirting with her, with her through text messages. My wife uh, caught me sending <laughs> messages to that girl. She tried to get divorced, and I couldn't explain that what I was doing, but my fucking main plan was. Jesus. Uh, and he said, uh, he said, until it actually worked, she gave me her personal phone number, and I started like tracking her. So when I started tracking her, I delivered that to the DA. And the DA had 
the exact location of El Chapo. And that's how the, he was captured for the third time when he was like running under the sewer system and all that stuff. Um, and when they capture him, he, the doctor was like shit, like scared. It's like, okay, one thing is to hand out a lieutenant, but the other thing is to actually hand out El Chapo. Um, and I remember everywhere in the news was like they caught El Chapo over a phone location, uh, and they, they thought it was one of these men, but it was actually one of these women. Ooh. And yeah, so so this guy was super scared. So the DA was like, "Okay, thank you." They kept him in the U.S. They gave him another, I don't know, one year or whatever of, of free housing and all that stuff. And then they started like pushing him again. So what else? What else do you have? And it's like, I just handed over El Chapo. What else do you want me to have? Uh, and they're like, "Okay, you're gonna have to testify when El Chapo goes to tr- on trial, um, but also uh, we need you." to digging sources and to keep bringing information in order for you to stay here. I He gave me the phone of the DA special agent in charge of this case, and I spoke over the phone with him. Um, and then at the middle of the interview, he was like, okay, so who am I speaking again with? And I'm like, Luis Chaparro, a journalist, and blah, blah, blah. And, this, and he just hung up the phone. And then my editor got a call by the DA supervisor. And he's like, okay, you need to stop that story because that's going to get us in trouble. And it's not that we're getting in fucking trouble. They were just getting, you know, like bad press because of what they're doing with, with their own informants. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I published that story, got a bit of backlash uh, from the DA. And uh, but but I but I but I learned that, the I mean, those guys also, they see everyone as disposable. I'm, I'm talking about the agency, the, the most most of the uh, U.S. federal agencies. Um, the doctor now lives in the U.S. and thanks to the article, who was actually big, he got to stay in the U.S. with uh, with proper documentation. He went um, to the uh, to El Chapo trial, although he wasn't called to to testify. Uh, he was like on a standby list, and apparently he's uh, he's living a happy life somewhere in the U.S. <laughs> wow, and he's not yeah. he's like completely. Completely protected. Yeah, they changed his, his um, full identity. Uh, he is in his family. He's, uh, they changed his name. He's, uh, I mean, he, he's uh, now using like sort of like a custom, you know, like different as w- what he used to, to wear and look his appearance. So yeah, he's, he's totally protected. And he says he doesn't really feel that secure, you know, but, but he's fine. And I mean that that was like three years ago, uh, when I when I spoke the last time with them. Wow, and the um, yeah. I mean that's obviously like one of the biggest stories in in sort of you know narco news in general the past the past decade. But then also there's the uh, you know the Kiki Camarena story, which has gotten a lot of news. I think the past yeah. couple of years as new information, new theories have come out. Can you um, exactly? Yeah, can you dive uh, into that a bit? Because you were on that pretty early. Yeah, exactly. I mean, right now everybody knows the, the story because of the last star uh, documentary and, and all the all of the uh, news stories uh, around. But uh, we're talking that I published that story in 2013, but I was working on that story since 2012, um, and that was because when uh, well, I, I, I was fascinated by the story of of, of um, Rafael Caro Quintero, and I went up to one of his ranches. And then I spoke with the family of Kiki Camarena as well. So I started like digging up in that, that story. And then uh, one day someone shared a contact with me and said like, okay, you, you need to talk to this person. He's a former CIA contractor who used to, he's a, he's a pilot and he lives in uh, New Mexico. So I called him and he started like, telling me all these crazy stories about how he was flying drugs and arms back and forth uh the u.s and to mexico for uh, for for the guadalajara cartel but also for the u.s government how he was contracted by the cia to work that so i asked him to if we can put up a meet in person uh and i drove over to his house in in new mexico and he opened the door it's an old man with uh with a gun on his uh, on his hand and three dogs, three huge fucking dogs. Mm. And I was like, man, I'm I'm not a threat, like really, <laughs> believe me. And so he's like, yeah, I just need to, you know, like to to 
scan you for if you have uh, an arm or anything on you. We started talking. He offered coffee. We started like chatting, and dude, he had most crazy stories. He said like the CIA was not only involved, but the CIA was responsible for killing Kiki Camarena. And I was being told this by a man who was contracted by the CIA for that operation. So he got a hold of two of his friends, Hector Berreyes, and another man that I, I escaped his name right now, and three other informants that uh, that appear on the, on the last narc, Mexican former police officers, judiciales. And so we, I start talking to all of them about this story, and they start sharing maps, they start sharing uh, credentials, they start sharing uh, videotapes, photos, all of that stuff to prove that it was actually the CIA who killed Kike Camarena because he actually found uh, that the U.S. was uh, funding the uh, the uh, basically a, a plan to fight the guerrillas, right, in, in, in Central America. And to do that, he was literally funding uh, the Guadalajara cartel, Rafael Caro Quintero and Felix Gallardo and all of those guys. They were handing out a huge amounts of money and of guns and trafficking on their own planes into the U.S. through a through a company, through a fake company, um, in exchange for for them to give out training to people to go and fight the guerrillas in Central America. So that was a fascinating story, and I remember publishing that that story in the in Proceso magazine, one of the main uh, in investigative journalism stories. I mean, uh, magazines in Mexico, and getting a lot of fucking backlash by, by by the DEA also in the US, saying that my sources were not good in the head, and that they were actually dismissed uh, from their post because they were, you know, like uh, not not properly wealthy, you know, like psychologically speaking. Um, and then I also got a call by a Mexican politician that he told me that he was going to sue me because of all of the fucking lies. And I was, I mean, to be honest, that time I was pretty fucking scared because I was messing with, you know, like full on governments. A Mexican politician and the DEA calling me a liar, calling me bullshit and, and stuff and getting a lot of threats on my social. I, I left for Brazil for a couple of months and uh well the whole thing like cooled off and then it became a mainstream story man and i'm pretty glad that it did you know i'm pretty happy that it's actually uh you know like common knowledge right now that the cia was behind the kiki camarena as a um, assassination uh yeah i mean it's pretty crazy i did not know that you had to flee uh you had to flee to brazil which is is pretty pretty wild and yeah that was that big doc that came out i think a year or two ago that that yeah. has the same uh, the same theory, and I think interviews probably some some of the same people. Did you did you exactly. work on that at all? No, no, not at all. I, I didn't even know that that they were putting out that that story. I mean, how I feel about stories that you know, no, the stories that doesn't really belong to anyone. The stories are out there, and whoever wants them and have the proper sources can tell tell you're, stories all over you're again. You're a lot more so, mature than me about that stuff. Yeah, man. I'd be like, I mean, fuck them. They took my story. They didn't even call me. <laughs> I did this shit first. How dare they? At least pay me a consultancy. Yeah. <laughs> no, man. I mean, to be, to be honest, like I'm, I'm happy. Um, because I mean, was I mean, they, they got to the to the center of the story. They actually told the story good. And it's actually now mainstream knowledge because of that. And and that's that's pretty dope. At the end, that's my main goal right here, right? To to tell the story, to tell them right to set the stories uh, right and to let people know what the shit is happening. And, and if I'm doing that without recognition, that's that's totally perfect by me, as long as the fucking story is, you know, like legit and, and the story is like straight up, you know? Yeah, I'd like to see your pockets get some more recognition. You know what I'm saying? But uh, I think we're running out of time. I think we've got about five or six minutes left on the Zoom. So I just wanted to get an update. You know, there's been a lot happening, I think, in, um, in the Mexican narco world the past couple months, right? Uh, Carol Quintero just got arrested again. Um, yeah. Stuff going on with El Mayo's kids and things like that. Can you just give us sort of like a brief update on on what you're seeing and what's happening right now? Yeah, and what, what I what I what I'm seeing happening right now, and speaking to also like to sources in, in the U.S. and in Mexico, is that the U.S. negotiated with Mexico a, a deal to asking 
the Mexican government to go after the Sinaloa cartel. The Sinaloa cartel was not getting a lot of hits by by Mexico, right? I mean, Mexico was getting maybe one or two people from the cartel Jalisco and one of or two like lower level members of the Sinaloa cartel, but of, of like from from the you know lowest factions of, of the Sinaloa cartel. So now the Sinaloa cartel became a major target for the U.S. because of the quantities of fentanyl that is getting into the U.S. and most of that is uh, produced and trafficked by the Sinaloa cartel. Not saying that the cartel Jalisco Nueva Generación is not also producing and trafficking fentanyl, but not even close to the quantities that the Sinaloa cartel is doing it right now. So um, that was a political negotiation between both governments to go after the Sinaloa cartel in a harder way. And that's why the first show of Mexico saying, okay, we're going to deliver an ordeal. I don't know what Mexico asked in return for that deal, to be honest. I mean, it's yet to be seen. Um, but uh, but I think right in the middle is the arrest of Carlos Quintero, which was a main target for, for, for the U.S. And the Mexican authorities always knew where he was hiding and what, what, what he was doing or what he was up to. Um, and now they're going uh, that that's going to clean up the terrain. So they're going to go now after the Chapitos pretty fucking hard. And I wouldn't be surprised if they actually get to them. Uh, what I'm not seeing is they going as hard uh, with the Zambada family. The Zambada family has been getting a lot of benefits from the U.S. and Mexican government through the through the last years. Four of the five kids of El Mayo Zambada are now free, are not in jail, and they benefited from uh, sharing information uh, directly to the U.S. And of course, El Mayo Zambada, it's still at large in Mexico. So I think we're going to see big changes in the Sinaloa cartel organization uh, in the coming days, if not months. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, El Mayo's always been a slick one. You know, he's always played the background. So I envision him being really good at, uh, or his people being very good at coordinating all this sort of stuff and really, you know, taking advantage of the situation. I think we unfortunately have a couple minutes left. Can you tell people, you know, where they can see your work, where they can find you, YouTube, Twitter, all that sort of stuff? Sure, man. I mean, I will, I will say, uh, go to my, to my um, Instagram account at Luis Kuriaki. The first one is with a, with a Y. And um, I'm, I'm very active on Instagram, showing up uh, and having a lot of up- updates. And from there, you can link, uh, click my link in bio and go to my other um, socials, my Substack account, my YouTube channel. But, um, but I will tell people to go and, and follow me on, on Instagram. Yeah, it's Luis Kuriaki. It's L-U-I-S. K U R Y A K I, and you can also yes. just look at um, Lewis. Lewis's uh, his work is all over the place. You know, he's doing a lot of stuff for Vice, I think, and uh, and everyone else. But um, dude, thanks so much for for joining us for being a part of it. And uh, yeah, stay safe out there, man. Where are you? Where are you based right now? I'm based out of uh, Ciudad Juarez as well. I'm, I'm I go back and forth from Ciudad Juarez, El Paso, and Mexico City, but I, I spend a lot of, a lot of time in Ciudad Juarez. Cool. Thanks so much, dude. All right, my man. Thank you. Yeah.